And now I'm supposed to talk about responding to reviewer methodological concerns, but I don't know enough about that to make a you know, really 15 or 20 minute talk. So I'm talking more generally about the review process and some, some methodological concerns as well. And uh, let's see if I can get, yeah. I, I've been here and listened to the presentations, not just this week, but last week and the week before. <clears throat> and actually, this week's was less technical than the others, but they, they tended to be pretty technical. And, uh, uh, and what I'm going to do is shift gears here and make a talk that's more behavioral. Uh, behavioral theory, as all of you know, is based on the notion that humans are not only non-logical, but predictably non-logical. They behave in predictable ways that, uh, that, uh, don't, that kind of defy logic, if you will. <clears throat> When you become a real behavioral theorist, I like to think, when you become a real behavioral theorist is when you are able to fully understand that this theory applies to you too. And there are decision biases, that means your decisions are biased too. And if there are perceptual problems, that means you've got perceptual problems too. And I think that's a, that's a hard hurdle to get over sometimes, but the review process will, uh, Bert, if yes. I could just interrupt you for a moment. Um, your sure. screen isn't being shared. I don't know if you were wanting to, I know you had oh. some nice sh slides that you had already shared with, with me. So I was hoping you would share them with the audience as well. Yeah, I thought I had it up there, sorry. Yeah, I wonder. What are you seeing on the screen? We see you in your office. Okay, sorry. No worries. Let me see if I can go back and get out of this. Try one more time. Yeah, I'm sharing on screen too. That's right, in the mic. That's not working. Where am I clicking, Mike? Oh, how's that? Go. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, okay. Let me start over. Sorry about that. Sorry to seem like a neophyte on this technology stuff. I actually taught a course on using, uh, you taught three courses using Zoom, but for some reason this isn't working right for me. Uh, again, the presentations that I've heard have been pretty technical in, in nature, and my approach is going to be much more behavioral. So behavioral theory, as all of you know, is based on the notion that humans are often not only non-logical, but predictably so. They behave in predictable ways that, that defy logic. And uh, when, you, when, you're really, when you're really ready to become a behavioral theorist, I mean, I, I, I understood behavioral theory from the beginning, <laughs> most of it, some of it anyway. And, and, but as time, is, and I, always, I always kind of implicitly assumed it applied to other people, but not to me. I think when you, when you really... Uh, accept and embrace in behavioral theory is when you realize it applies to, to both everybody else, but you too. And so you start applying it in, in your own work in life. And I think it, it leads to some interesting outcomes. The review process is one of those where it really comes to, to bear. Now, I want to emphasize this and, and feel free, anybody feel free to disagree with me on what I'm saying here. I don't mind defending my thoughts. Methodology is important, but it's a tool. And ordinarily, it's not enough to sell a manuscript to reviewers. What sells a manuscript to reviewers is some theoretical contribution, something that reviewers have learned from reading the manuscript. And they say, that's right. That's, that's a good point. That point needs to be said it publicly and, and uh, spread broadly, disseminated broadly. I think that's really critical. The methodology is going to be very important. And again, I'm not, I'm not downplaying methodology. In addition, DJ... And John Busenbark and Trevor Serto and others have done well publishing methodological papers. That's a different story. <clears throat> and I'll have something to say about that as we go along. But most of us uh, do normal empirical work to get tenure and keep our jobs. And in those, in those cases, uh, the methodology tends to be a tool, not, not something that drives the, the, the manuscript itself, but it sells it to reviewers. Reviewers 
if they like what you're saying and they, they feel like it's important to get it out, they'll accept some methodological shortcoming if, if they find that theory compelling. And typically there'll be some methodological shortcomings in every kind of you know, situation you, you find yourself in anyway. So that's an important aspect to catch on to. Um, by the way, I often, I review a lot of papers, a lot of papers. I'm on seven editorial boards. Uh, very often, my mind's pretty made up about the paper by the time I get to the method section. And if it's not something that I feel like is important, or I feel like the logic is off, or I feel like it doesn't make a contribution, the methods aren't going to save it. Now, here we'll start some behavioral approaches to, to reviewing. If you've received a revise and resubmit, one way to think about it is the acting editor Normally, think about the acting editor is kind of wanting to publish your paper. Now, they're not just jumping up and down wanting to publish your paper, but they want to publish your paper. An associate editor has to publish papers. There's nothing worse for any journal editor than for the date for a new issue to come around and them not have any papers to put in an issue. They've got to publish papers. And so uh, they, they, they go through a lot of rejections, too. So when you get a revise and resubmit, the associate editor typically is, is positively inclined towards your paper. Now, <laughs> there's no guarantee and you can't act like they're accepting your paper. That'd be terrible. Um, but I'll never forget my first uh, revise and resubmit. I, I was, I was been hugely influenced by Michael Lubatkin and Don Hamrick. Uh, the two, two guys who really taught me a lot about responding to reviewers. And when I when we got our, we had our uh, journey, uh, AMJ back in the early 90s, Michael Lubatkin and I sent in. Back then you mailed them in and they mailed you back the reviews in hard copy. And I got the reviews back, called Michael that morning, said, man, I got the reviews back there, tough. He said, uh, and I said, uh, they're saying it's extremely high risk. And he said, wait a minute, did they invite revisions or not? I said, yeah, they invited revisions. He said, they always say it's extremely high uh, risk. They're never gonna make it easy on you. We'll get it in. And in his mind, it became at that point a negotiation process. And he worked through with the, with the reviewer comments and had, had philosophical points and, and rules of thumb he used on all kinds of reviewer commentary that really helped out for me. But again, keep in mind, hey, you have to accept manuscripts. They're gonna tell you it's high risk because they don't wanna let you down in a subsequent round and they want you to take it very seriously. But normally they become more conciliatory as time goes by. Now, there are some exceptions to this rule. There are some exceptions to this rule, and I'm going to try to, to uh, talk about those a little bit. Uh, when Dan Shindell founded the Strategic Management Journal in 1980, for the first 20 something years, Dan was the editor and he was the sole editor. His wife, Mary Lou, ran a review process, and uh, they'd often spend 12 months, uh, 10, 12 months in the review process. So it wasn't like you get your response back in 30 days. But Dan also had a philosophy, and that was that. Reviewers should make the choice about publication. He was hesitant to, to intervene as an associate editor. That's normally not the way things go. Normally the AE's decision process is gonna provide you with some guidance and they're gonna, they're gonna have their own viewpoint and they're gonna to try to help you to some extent by, by navigating the other reviews. So in order to get a paper published, I had the, wonderful experience <laughs> once of a paper going through the review process without actually getting any reviews and they accepted it when I sent it in. It's a long story, I'll tell you about it sometime. But it was great, but you sure can't build a career on it. Normally the, the road to publication is a revise and resubmit process and the associate editor decision process is key. So I always look to the AE to give me guidance on how should I respond and what should I prioritize in terms of my responses. And I think that's really critical. But as Michael pointed out to me back then, each and every point raised by the reviewer should be linked to a specific change in the paper that you can explain to that reviewer and point to to that reviewer. And I think that's really critical. So each and every point raised by each reviewer should be linked to some specific revision. Now, in my experience, and I've gotten even, even including rejections, the first round review of revisions, the first round of revisions has dramatically improved my manuscripts. In fact, I had a, had a policy for a while. When I wanted to publish a paper in AMJ, 
I'd send it to ASQ first. They'd reject it. They always reject it. But uh, they'd give me good reviews, good comments, and I would reframe the paper. And again, in every case, I got to revise and resubmit from AMJ. So that's, that's uh, uh, the reviewer comments, painful as they are, they're going to really help you figure out what's wrong with your paper, what you've been doing wrong, and what maybe how you might need to change your approach. Now, writing is uh, really critical here, too. And writing, in my, I imagine writing metaphorically, I think about it as taking charge of the reader's consciousness and leading the reader along a pathway. Now, by taking charge of the reader's consciousness, you're not taking it away from the reader. It's still the reader's consciousness. And their own minds are going to be active and involved and engaged here. But you're leading their, their thought processes. I, in, in almost every case, I start my responses to reviewers. I look at their comments and thinking, what in my writing led this reviewer to think this? And very often when I do that, I go back to my paper, the manuscript, and I can see exactly what I said that was wrong, or I framed it wrong or said the wrong words. And uh, one thing I was impressed with with DJ's presentations, he uses, he uses the right words. He can explain in a pithy way, in an in a abbreviated way, a pretty complex statistical issue. Normally that's hard to do though, and I'm not very good at that. In, in other cases, normally for me, it's a framing thing uh, where I've lost, where, where my words, intended to do one thing led the reviewer's mind in a different way. And then I think if you think about it that way, it'll help you to respond and understand where the reviewers are coming from and go back to your own words because your words are what caused it. Every reviewer comment came from your words and choices you made in the review process. So think about that where they've noted, noted issues or concerns. It's often where you have not done a good job in positioning the paper appropriately. So very often, especially in the introductory section of the paper, when you get outside the introduction and the overview, it becomes more a flow problem, more a flow issue, but especially in the introduction where you're trying to, to put the reader in context. I very often stop and think about specifically, what do I want the reader to be thinking about right here at this point? And do my words lead toward that objective? And reviewer comments, again, will be really helpful to you as you go through this uh, go through this process. They often really help you diagnose your issues. Now, one more thing from Lubatkin. When I was, a, when I was just starting out, I always was hesitant to make these promises of contribution. It felt like I was bragging. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> I long ago got over that, but at the time it felt like I was bragging and I'd, I'd always downplay it. Michael used to say, hit them over the head with it. If you're making, if you think your paper makes a contribution, don't beat around a bush, hit them over the head with it. But at the same time, be careful with your promises of contribution because most, I've found an awful lot of reviewers and I'm, certainly I'm one of them, an awful lot of reviewers will go back after they, they'll look at the contributions say in the introductory section. And after they're through reading the paper, they'll go back to those, those contributions and say, how well did this get fulfilled? How well did this paper deliver? And uh, so you need to, you, if you're going to make promises of contribution, you need to deliver on those promises and make sure that it's, it's done in a convincing and compelling way. Now, with respect to methodological issues, uh, again, feel free to disagree with me. This is just my observations, having <laughs> sent a couple hundred papers through the process or not. Uh, and with respect to analytical methodology, reviewers tend to fall into two camps. They're very, very expert, or they're not very expert at all. Now, your paper has to get past both of those folks. So a couple of rules of thumb I always use. I don't try to differentiate too much between the highly expert and the mentally. But if they ask for a specific analysis, do it. That was another one of Michael Lubatkin's thing. Even if you don't want to do it and you think it's wrong, do it and send it to them. And, uh, and explain why, if you don't want to include it in the paper, if you think it's a poor analysis or it doesn't fit what you're trying to do, do it anyway, send it to them in an appendix, explain why you don't want to use it in the paper. And I think that'll help you a lot. That's always worked for me. And I've always been concerned that reviewers would be afraid I was insulting them 
and it's almost never happened. But whatever you do, don't try to avoid request and analysis. As Michael said, if you don't do it, they'll think you're lazy. And I think that's probably correct, even though you're not lazy. That's, that's probably been correct and certainly worked out for me. Even if I don't want to do it or if I think it, it doesn't fit the context or the situation, I still do it. I send it to them. I explain in, in careful and, and polite detail why it's, it's not appropriate or I don't want to use it or why it's misleading or whatever. But I don't try to avoid it. Now, if your study uses, and again, feel free to disagree with me. I'm, I'm interested in BJ's thoughts on this. If your study uses some innovative new methodology, expect trouble. Expect trouble. You're going to think, this is great. This is really going to be new. It's going to open up all kinds of doors. And their most reviewers, especially the non-expert reviewer, is not going to understand it or understand why you're using it and going to have difficulty following your logic. That's uh, normally, if they have confusion, they say no. If they don't understand, they just say no. So I've, I have a couple of rules I like to follow for me. And again, uh, this is maybe an anachronism these days. Um, I used to say, and I had a couple of, of methodology experts over the years say they like this comment. I used to say when I was younger, OLS will get you 95% of the way there. I still kind of think that, but it doesn't always work as well as it used to. But OLS is something you can rely on and count on. New methodologies require time and effort to really get into and understand. And we, our, our, the field's understanding of those new methodologies emerges over time too. We've been using panel data for many years. We used to call it PCSTS, pool cross-sectional time series, because our approach back then was what we wanted to do was treat it as cross-sectional data. But, uh, but in fact, it was panel instead. But it's taken a long time to learn and become widely familiar with the ins and outs of that methodology. So I often have doctoral students coming to me that want to use some innovative new methodology. And I always say, explain to me what this does that I can't do with OLS. And normally there's a good explanation that they would do that. They would explain it in a way what it does that I can't do with OLS, but the student almost never can explain what it is. And if that's the case, I don't want to use it. So if you, you always, you need to use the simplest methodology that meets the needs of your study and need to be able to explain why you didn't use an even simpler methodology on it. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Now, one more thing here on, on, on these analyses, especially using a lot of the newer approaches, uh, especially things like general method of moments and so forth, uh, generalized method of moments. I have real trouble with stability. One of, the, one of the cool things about OLS is it's rock solid. You can change your model around and reformulate it. It's not gonna change your coefficients a lot. The R squared is not gonna jump up and down. It's gonna behave itself. If it doesn't, you have multicollinearity for the most part. You can combine some variables and it's something you can troubleshoot and work with. Some of these other methodologies, it's really troublesome to figure out what's wrong. But let me tell you, if you run your analysis, where if you drop a variable, it changes completely your results, or you add a variable, it changes completely your results. I don't submit stuff like that. I don't think, if it's not stable and fairly easy to replicate, and the joke used to say, if you have to hold your mouth just right to get the results you're looking for, it's not gonna hold up. So be sure uh, that, that you, you report results of things that are stable and rock solid if you're in. If your coefficients are jumping around all over the place, there's something wrong. You need to change methodologies. Now, it was mentioned in a couple of earlier presentations, not today, but in earlier days, that, that you should learn, you should not get stuck with one methodology. I actually found it to be very useful to be stuck with one methodology. When I was a doctoral student, my, my dissertation was on executive turnover following mergers and acquisitions. And that happens to fit an event history methodology really good. So I spent a long time, about six months, really intensively trying to understand what is this methodology? How does it work? Where's it used for? What are its advantages and disadvantages? And, it's, and once I got really deeply into it, following what DJ was saying earlier, the method started driving some of the theory too. I started seeing research questions that I could answer with the methodology. I used to say, when you got a hammer in your hand, everywhere you look, you see a nail. And that happened to me. Everywhere I looked, I saw a nail. That, that panel that I could use event history to resolve 
or at least provide an effective way of, of running analyses. So event history was really valuable for me. And it's, it's still something I use all the time, almost every day. If you're a strategy researcher, you really have to understand some the, the basics of panel data and selection problems. Those two things are going to be with you forever. And, and one of our, I, I really enjoyed, uh, again, some of the comments today and, and trying to cross levels and work with people from the micro area. I think it's very valuable to do that. But one, one of the issues I think that, that comes out when you try to work with your micro colleagues is their data tends to be a lot more better, a lot better behaved than ours does. You take a large sample of firms and try to collect ROA, for example, you're going to find it, it jumps all over the place. It's really a, and it's, <laughs> it's a ratio, DJ. <laughs> so I, I fully agree with your comments on the ratio article. I, I, Travis asked me to comment on that paper before they submitted it. And I, I had some, uh, some thoughts on it. I, I agree with what they're saying, but man, if we don't use ratios, what are we going to do? It, it really becomes troublesome for us. So, so it's an issue. And selection problems and their remediation, really important to, to panel methodologies, but also just a general strategy research. There's no way you're going to get your data past reviewers without an intuitive understanding of how selection might affect your, your analyses and, and what you need to do about it. Now, finally, uh, my last slide, reviewers tend to follow fads and fashions and the field does this too. So when I came out in 1989, nobody mentioned selection problems. It, was, it never came up. It wasn't an issue. Most people didn't understand panel data methodologies very well at that point. And, and a, a lot of papers were published that weren't too rigorous on that issue. But as Michael Lebatkin used to say to me, just because those reviewers let them, because those folks get away with it, doesn't mean our reviewers are going to let our, get, our people get away, are not going to let us get away with it. And I think that's right. So, so the, the demands for rigor change over time and they, they, uh, they evolve and you have to meet these evolving needs, whatever they happen to be. So I think when I, when I first learned about selection issues, uh, I think it was Hamilton and Nickerson was, was the first paper I really got into detail with it on. I realized this is, this is definitely the case, but it's, it wasn't a new issue in strategy. Henry Minsberg has, has talked for uh, decades about how you can't parachute into a timeline like strategy and start, start analyzing causal relationships without thinking about the history of where it, where it all came from. And I think that's, that's still true. So selection, we've come to understand it a lot better and, and so forth, but it's taken 15 years for the methodology to really kind of evolve to the point that we understand it's hard to work with. And, and finding instruments especially is really tricky and, and maybe, maybe not possible in, in some cases. Also, uh, um, John Busenbart pointed out last week in his great presentation that where he'd done some simulations and found that the, uh, the selection re remedies are much more effective using selection approach than they are using two-stage least squares. And I thought that was a really interesting uh, conclusion to, to bring. But, but he also talked about the ITCV statistic, the impact threshold of a confounding variable. I think this is one reason why that statistic has so quickly gained popularity because even a non-expert reviewer recognizes immediately what the logic is behind it and the value of it. And a single statistic can often do a lot to calm down people's nerves. So selection issues are gonna be something you're gonna to have to work with, no doubt about it. Endogeneity is endemic to the kind of research we do. But ITCV can, I think is gonna to, to lessen a lot of the impact that, that we've seen for some of the attempts to statistically control for selection. So that's that's uh, that's what I got. Uh, thanks for your, for listening. Great, thank you for sharing those insights from both your writing process and reviewing process. I think those were again really spot on and um, got to a lot of the points that. Um, that we care about both when we're writing papers and when we're reviewing papers. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience. Hi, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Albert, okay. for the great presentation. I really enjoyed it. 
Um, so I, I recently got my first rejection from a journal. So um, my, and you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I know it's going to be uh, a life of rejection from now on uh, as, as a scholar. Um, you, you, you mentioned about how, uh, how the theoretical contribution is, is really important. Um, yeah. So what my question is like, um, what I thought was a theoretical contribution, the reviewers uh, might think, well, we don't really think that's a uh, Was I muted? Yeah, I think it came on and off. You're on now though. Oh, yeah. The so, reviewers don't uh, think it's a contribution. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what do you usually do when what you think is a, is a contribution, but reviewers don't think, do you just scrape everything and uh, start from the beginning or, or do you have any? Uh... Sometimes you can reframe it, Jimmy. Sometimes you can reframe it in, in terms of theory where, where the contribution comes to a little bit different place. But I'd go back to my writing. I, I suggest you go back to your writing. Think about how did I connect this to the, the existing literature? What are the main bodies of theory I try to connect to? What did I? What words did I use in doing that? And and did were they convincing? Did they? Did they? Sometimes, as you're trying to lead the reviewer into the into lead the reader into the paper, you, you get sidetracked or you, or you use words. And I, I can't give you any strong examples of this, but I see it every time I get a review. I go back. They'll they'll say something. And I said. What in my writing made that person think that? And I think use that diagnostic to go back to your initial paper and see how your writing led them to believe it wasn't a theoretical contribution. Often they'll give you some clues as to what they were thinking. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes the, the contribution isn't that great, but you have to you have to do the best you can with it. Thank you. Good advice. Any, do we have some other questions for Bert? Um, I had a question, um, Bert. Thank you so much. I too am okay. interested. I do um, work in mergers and acquisitions and yes, I'm deep in event studies right now. Uh, and so I was wondering when you look at some of your former papers and you look at that, especially the one about executive turnover, what are your thoughts in terms of going back and looking at papers that have used um, that there are now new methodologies that are accepted to go back and examine the same, the same theologic, theological framework. And then um, also, when what is your best practice for managing heteroscedasticity within your um, panel data, your event data? Yeah, um, a couple of the thoughts. It almost never works. With regarding the first part of your question, even if the paper that let's, let's say there's an existing paper that's been published for a long time, uses a really poor methodology, doesn't work. It's not a very good methodology at all. You know it's not a good methodology. It's very difficult to get a paper published by fixing that methodology, especially if you come to the same conclusions. I mean, if you can if you can demonstrate how uh, that conclusions were incorrect. But even then, Nikisha, expect, expect a fight. You know, as hard as it is to get papers through the review process, once they come out in print, they're treated as gospel. And it's, it's hard, to, it's hard to, to challenge them in that way. But it's very difficult empirically. Uh, I've had uh, many years, and when I was a doctoral student, I thought, I'll get a better sample than these folks used and, and, this, uh, and demonstrate either that it works or reinforces whatever. They don't take that. And the reviewers will never accept that as a contribution. Uh, I think uh, uh, it, it's, you have to have a, a, a different theoretical question or some way that you're framing it somehow. I mean, you can rarely, rarely make, make it work. And again, especially if you're gonna reinforce the conclusion that they already drew, then that takes considered to be no contribution at all. Even though we talk about the need for replication and the importance of replication, I think uh, we don't we don't really act that way in, in practice. And heteroscedasticity, there are other people who can do a lot better job of that. But fixed effects are something that I often try to use 
Although, although DJ's got some good commentary on that and how it works and so forth. Uh, sometimes you can standardize within within uh, cross section, but uh, that's 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 one kind of a it's a blunt instrument. I'm the non-expert reviewer here. DJ, what are your thoughts on that? How would you control for heteroscedasticity? It depends on what you ultimately are trying to accomplish when you have it. You know, a lot of the methods now can solve it relatively easily through use of good standard errors, better standard errors that will actually just account for it. So most of the time, if you're using robust yeah, standard right. errors over time, then you you tend to be pretty good, even in a, like a, a logit model that will usually work. So yeah. yeah, you're right. Clustered will work. Some people think that clustering solves the problem of unobserved firm heterogeneity. It does not. So you can do both at the same time too. That is, that is no problem. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I see um, Jing Ning, I see you have your hand up. Yes, uh, hello, Albert. Uh, you mentioned several times about the importance of writing. And as a doctoral student, I, I, I try to practice writing as much as I can, but there are so many good books and so many uh, papers in top journals that I can learn as models. Sometimes I just feel lost in the process. So what's your best advice to practice writing to better communicate in, in academic writing? Well, if you're, if you're a student, you can ordinarily get your, your uh, supervisor or other faculty to, to look at your, your writing. But one thing to think about is to try to go through them in some detail. I, I usually try to sit down in some detail with someone we start with the first sentence and then the second sentence, then the third sentence. Now, where are we going? What's this going to, how are readers going to interpret this? What's going to be said? And very often, you know, related to this too, uh, related to this too, I, when, I, when I made my job talk, here at A&M, we don't let anybody go give a job talk without practicing in front of our group. And we give them feedback and comments, but they didn't do that when I was a doctoral student. Don Hamburg wanted to see my slides. And it just, it just it really hit me like a ton of bricks. I never thought about it before. But all he wanted to see was my slides. And he walked through those slides. And back then, it was just tr transparencies. He walked through my slides and said, oh, get this off this slide. These words, the, you don't want these words here. Reviewers are going to, readers or listeners are going to think this with these words. And so the choice of words is careful. The choice of phrasing is careful. And having somebody go through your slides, I've actually used that since that point. Uh, I've tried to get doctoral students to give me their slides before they give a job talk. And, and with the mind to both bolster what they're saying, but also avoid this business where you make a reference in a slide that leads readers way away. And so part of what you're trying to do at your stage of the game is understand what do words mean to others versus what they mean to me and to bring your, your thinking kind of in line with that. And I think it really helps. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there, um, and that's uh, definitely very good advice in terms of um, doing the job talk early and often in front of your department and anyone else you can corner into listening. Um, so <laughs> harking back to Rodina's early advice of when we started this session. Um, Valerie, I see you have a question. Yeah, hi Albert. Thank you for the talk. Um, a quick question. What do you think about having competing hypotheses in one paper? Having competing, what? Competing yes, hypotheses? Competing hypothesis. Okay. Here's my rule on that. And it's a, it's a pretty firm one. It can't be because theory doesn't make a prediction. Theory has to make a prediction both ways. There has to be theory that leads to this prediction and theory that leads to this other prediction. If there's if you if you if you go through the through the theory and conclude that there's mixed evidence, and so you propose competing hypothesis, that is going to crash and burn. <laughs> you have to have clear theory making the opposite predictions. If that's the case, competing hypothesis will work. As a as a general rule, they're they're kind of a hard sell though. Um, but but I think uh, they, but there has to be clear theory 
leading both directions. It can't just be the evidence is mixed. The theory doesn't really predict this very well. So we're going to test. We're going to test and see which one's upheld. That's not a hypothesis. That, that won't that won't work. Hey, Bert, can I say something to that too? Sure, please do. I think, you know, the idea of those mixed findings that you mentioned, that is a like a theorist dream though too, to think about not, not to say competing hypotheses, but there's a lot of theoretical room to resolve inconsistent empirical findings and to build new theories that can explain both sides of it. So rather than trying That's to right. be competing in, in direct effects, think about the conditional effects of that relationship and you can advance research a lot in, in thinking that way. That's right. Yeah, that's a really good point, DJ. Um, I see a question in the chat from um, Jung Yoon. Did you want to share uh, that with everyone? Yes. yes. Um, thank you for your presentation, Albert. Uh, I have a question related to the theory, theoretical development. Um, as you underscore the theoretical development, um, as a PhD student, uh, the difficulty that I'm facing with sometimes is that uh, there are some terms, um, they use the different terms, but means the same or similar things. And um, as they're used in different contexts, uh, their implications sometimes a bit different. In that case, while I develop my theory, uh, it's a bit confused to how much I reflect on those terms and how can I use them in a way that I like to develop my theor uh, theoretical development. So I'd like to uh, listen to your advice on that uh, issue. Yeah, it's, it's important in, in what I've done. It's been important to use really clear terms. Now, if you feel like the, the literature the literature has used the same term for different concepts. Uh, highlighting that will be important and, and you have to be convincing. But it's probably gonna be a touchy thing with reviewers though when they see it. Um, if you need to, within your own paper, be very consistent about your terms. And so if you, if you use the word turnover and you define it as turnover, don't switch back and start using succession. That's a different term and that'll cause confusion. So you, you need to be very careful in your own writing to, to define terms early on and to use those consistent terms. Um, maybe some a couple of ways to think about it, as, as was mentioned earlier, the finance literature is quite a bit different than what we do. And sometimes they'll use a little bit different terminology, but, but normally their terminology also has a different historical context. So it's, it's a little bit tricky to be to pull terms from other fields. I mean, I'm, I'm not I don't have a good intuitive feel for what kind of situation you're confronting. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to. Uh, yeah, thank to, you. For providing. <laughs> yes, um, but I think. Uh, so, for example, uh, Mm. The thing that top of my head is um, can be a business model. Sometimes it that terms can be used for explaining the revenue model. Sometimes they want to explain that term in the context of activity system in an ecosystem. So they like to use that term as a uh, boundary expanding um, uh, activities so that uh, how a firm can uh, connect to the partners in the ecosystem and so on. So the way, uh, depending on how it is used, um, uh, I think this is the example that one term can be used in a different context. Um, but the, in that case, uh, how I need to um, use that term to theorize, uh, to, yeah. yeah, use that for my theoretical developments. Or sometimes I think uh, this term, 
the thing that I'm trying to say to you, like, um, I think platform leaders, platform sponsor, um, uh, leading firms, those kind of terms are, the terms yeah. themselves are different, but meaning the same thing. But sometimes um, they're used in a different context and they might have a bit different implications. In that case, um, as a student, uh, I'd like to talk about some type of farms in an ecosystem, but um, because of a slightly dif a slight difference among those terms, um, I'm not sure, sometimes I couldn't sure um, whether the use yeah. of those terms in my theoretical development is in the right directions or not. Yeah. So I'd like to ask yeah, and reviewers some will have their own. your your yeah, advice. Reviewers will that. have their own ideas about whether it fits or not. And I think that's important. A couple of things to be careful of, uh, uh, Jung Yoon, a couple of things to be careful of is drawing from too many areas. It tends to confuse reviewers. And they, they tend to not have a, have a harder time focusing or, or, or understanding your own theoretical placement. And you're obligated when you use those other terms, you're obligated in a few words at least to try to characterize the sense of how they've been used in that literature. And that's a dangerous thing to do, but I think it's really important. And your reviewers who may be familiar with that literature have to nod their head and understand that that's right, that your, your characterization of the use of that those terms is correct, but that's that again that's tricky to do. So it, it does it does cause a uh, a wording problem, I think. So the best uh, practice that I can follow is try to be as clear as possible in a, a way that I use the terms in my theoretical development and try to uh, link the most closest literature. Uh, to my theoretical development. Yeah, and make a choice in your own mind about is the difference worthy of discussion? If the difference is not worthy of discussion, don't even talk about it. Don't raise it because when you raise it, they're gonna, they're gonna, it's going to come into the reader's consciousness and they're going to start analyzing it. So if you feel like, if you in your heart feel like they're using these words to mean the same thing in a different setting, I wouldn't open that door and, and have a discussion of it. If you think there are differences that are important and can inform your research, then I would spend more time and effort on it and try to develop it. But I always, it's kind of my metaphorical thing is, I don't like to open a door if I'm not gonna walk through it. <laughs> Great, Like don't so introduce much. a gun in a play in the first act if you're not going to fire it by the third act. <laughs> <laughs> um. Are there some other questions? I think those were good questions and, and answers. And I think um, from Bert, from what you've been saying, both in your talk, your slides, and also in these questions, I think the idea that I'm really getting is this um, idea of simplicity and really kind of thinking about what is it, what is your story? How are you making this argument convincingly with the least confusion possible for not just for reviewers and getting it through the process, but also for readers and for creating what I would say is the foundation for what we build on as a field. And I think oftentimes it's the most straightforward papers that have the power to be real, the most impactful in part because they make a point and you can really build on that. So I think that's really good advice. Um, but do we have some other, any other questions bef before we sign off? I would say, um, I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see any hands. So I just wanna thank all of the participants on the panel. I think these were three super talks. So thank you all for sharing your time and your insights. And um, I, I really felt that this, I, you know, I know it's geared towards doctoral students, but I, I really think it's valuable for everyone. Um, so thank you all again. I believe that we will be recording these um, talks and sharing them. Joanna and Mike, yes. if you want to comment uh, on that. All the talks are recorded and will be uploaded on SMS website. So I just really wanted to thank you all uh, today's, all the consortium participants since this is our, our last session. And Bert is actually our honorary consortium participant since he sat in on all the sessions, although I think the first two he joined under his alter ego, Mike Withers, uh, as I noticed. <laughs> 
Uh, but I really want to thank Bardina, DJ, and Bird for uh, really fascinating talks. Uh, I think we all learned something. And I think that the takeaway, as Cheryl mentioned, is when you're writing, you really need to craft simple but compelling stories. Reviewers are, are people and they're not gonna spend you know, 12 hours reading your paper. I, I often like to think about my colleague who sits on many editorial boards and now is a, an editor of an A journal and she did all her reviewing while on a treadmill or exercising. She just flipped through the paper as she was doing other things. So I always try and think of that reviewer, like they're probably on a treadmill, you know, I really need to make my point very clear and not stray into dragons, you know, on page 25. So um, again, uh, my big thanks to everyone. And thank you to Mike, who I feel the lion's share of the work and uh, putting together this consortium. Thank you very much to the SMS office, uh, especially to Robin for facilitating everything.